it feels like it's going to take uh i mean to be honest it feels like a lot of people are just never going to realize how power works i mean i think i think they never did and they never will and uh there's gonna be a lot of people who are just like oh it's bad for the environment and and that's kind of just gonna be just gonna be it really isn't it um yeah well that's also part of it sorry that's also i just want to add that's also part of it in terms of like i think changing the narrative right so like no one cares about energy consumption for things that they like right um Bitcoin mining uses less electricity today than Christmas lights do. Um, we still use Christmas lights, right? Because we feel that like there's, they give us utility, right? Like they're, the holidays are wonderful. Like I love December, right? Like it's, it's a really wonderful time to, to be walking around and especially in cities at night. Um, but like, is there like how much value is there to society in that, right? Whereas people look at Bitcoin mining, if they don't understand Bitcoin, it just looks like, oh, these guys are just wasting electricity or there's no value to it, right? Whereas really what we're doing is we're providing the security and of kind of the future of the financial sector, right? Bitcoin mining and proof of work is essentially what enables Bitcoin to be distributed um, and what enables the ledger to be immutable. Um, we haven't figured out how to do that on other systems. So I think there's also just um, a bit of an educational shift, not just in the power market, but helping people understand getting Bitcoin in the hands of more people so they understand its value and its utility and kind of telling the, those stories and then understanding that Bitcoin mining is like base layer infrastructure to enable that ecosystem to exist. So I think just over time as like Bitcoin becomes more widely adopted, um, you'll see probably that conversation shift a little bit, but yeah, it's a long process. <laughs> I mean, what I'm, what I'm hearing is that basically anyone from Bitmain listening, you need to create Christmas light uh, miners that are external, uh, yeah, external ready, right? So they could be outdoors. And as you're powering and mining Bitcoin, you're also powering a single LED and you can have them on like a tree, like, like a miner tree. I and mean, that's what it sounds like to me is the solution here. Uh, best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd buy one because it's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, anything that seems ridiculous, I'd buy. Quite frankly, uh, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin mining shoes. But no, um, yeah, I guess um, a question I had for for you was, uh, I, I don't know, because I don't know, yeah, I don't know how much you can disclose. I don't know how much you even necessarily would would know about us uh, because obviously you're publicly traded. But um, I didn't yeah. know if uh, if you guys, because obviously if anyone listening, uh, like ethical investment, something that's been around for a while, pe- there's there's ethical investment funds and ethical investors, people who don't invest in things they consider to be uh, adult entertainment, gambling, uh, huge waste of energy, things like that. Do you guys, have you run into like uh, ethical investment funds that are investing in you guys? Like now that they're potentially seeing a change in, people are seeing a change in, in view, right? Like, because um, obviously I can imagine, go back two years ago, uh, a big inv- ethical investment fund uh, that invests for the church and mosques and things like that would probably go yeah hell no we're not putting any of your money into this because it's wasting energy and it's terrible for the environment but now with this narrative change i didn't know if you guys had come across any sort of anything that would support that like ethical investment funds that are showing interest i know it's a bit of a specific question but i was just interested to see whether there is anything like that because that would really support the idea that there's a changing narrative yeah i think it's starting to happen but it's that's going to be a long process. I think there's some interest there, but you know, it's just getting data in front and that it's getting the right data in front of people, you know? So like the big thing that makes headlines, cause it sounds big and scary is like Bitcoin mining uses more electricity than small country. Right. Um, and I think that like that, that's off putting to people. Um, but you know, if you take it into context or if you look at other figures, it totally fits like a lot of the ethical investing, um, priorities to certain funds, you know? So just for example, the, um, so we're founding members of the Bitcoin Mining Council, which is essentially a, um, an amalgamation of a lot of the large miners. It started with mostly the publicly traded uh, Bitcoin miners in North America, and it's kind of spread and grown from that. And I forget exactly how large it is at this point, but we basically, what we do is we all just share data, it's anonymized, and then we compile that data to try to get a picture of what the industry actually looks like. Because that's actually one of the issues, right? It's like, we don't have data and metrics on really like what's going on, um, which is hard for people to swallow. Um, but you know, based on the latest studies that the Bitcoin Mining Council put out, and this was just this was last week, I think, maybe two weeks ago. Um, as an industry, we're almost sixty eight percent sustainable power. Um, that's more than any country. So Bitcoin mining as an industry is greener than any country um, that exists. Um, and then in terms of consumption, we use a fraction of what any major country would actually use. That's a large uh, producer. Um, in terms of like total energy, we consume 
0.1% of the world's energy, right? We're like, we're a rounding error, um, but we're a rounding error that's also driven by more sustainable power than any other country on the planet. So it's, I th those conversations are happening. I've certainly had some, but I think that there's just, there's, we're just very early in that, in that side of things. But yeah, I agree. I think um, sort of ethically focused, uh, funds are perfect uh, for Bitcoin mining and not just for that, but like if you think about the other benefits of Bitcoin, there's so much social utility for Bitcoin, right? I think, I mean, that's why we're really all in it. And I think most people you speak to in the, in the Bitcoin world are so for it, right? The idea that we're providing economic empowerment to billions of people who are unbanked, like that's, there's huge social utility there. Right. There have been what 56 or 55 um, instances of hyperinflation in human history, and 55 of those, or 54, whichever, have been in the last hundred years. Right. And if people don't have access to sound money, if they can't save and plan for the future, it's very difficult um, to increase standard of living. And so I think if you also just look at but that's you know, that's a longer conversation, right? And that's not a direct thing that we do. Um, that's an indirect, that's a direct thing that Bitcoin does and indirectly we do by participating in the network and helping secure it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's, there's tons of uh, ways to kind of push the ethical investing side of Bitcoin mining. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's a process. We're just very early stages. Um, Charlie, um, going back to the business side of, of mining, mm -hmm. uh, is it correct to assume that um, your, your company operates lightweight in the sense that they, you guys do not carry a lot of baggage because you intend to change and adapt you know, quickly to changes and you're expecting those changes. Now, I would like to understand what, because I believe that there's nothing that's ever, you know, ever risk-free. So what are the cons of operating you know, in such a manner? Oh, what's, what are the risks of like that model of being agile, if you would? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, the biggest ones are sort of, so the biggest ones are, I would say, systemic, which every Bitcoin miner would face, right? Like what happens if Bitcoin mining is outlawed, right? Which I don't foresee that happening. It's a state by state issue, but I think there's there's systemic risks or, you know, what happens if Bitcoin goes to zero, right? Um, we obviously don't believe that's going to happen. We think there's way too much in institutional interest in it at this point. Um, so there are systemic risks that we carry, but every Bitcoin miner carries, right? Um, just because we're dependent on Bitcoin. Um, for our model specifically, I would say where we kind of get some pushback is um, because we outsource so much of what we do, for people to believe in our ability to execute on our operations, they essentially also have to believe in our partner's ability to execute, right? So our deployments with Compute North, for example, um, we're not the ones who are actually building the data centers. We're not laying foundational concrete, right? We're not putting in the transformers and switch gears. We kind of rely on them to do that. So the questions become, well, how do we know we can trust your partners, right? How do we know that you guys can execute on the strategy you've outlaid? Um, so I would say that's the risk and that you don't have everything directly under your control. Um, but we do everything that we can to mitigate that. Um, we work, we choose our partners very carefully. We work very closely with them. Um, for us, just like data point, Compute North, we've actually worked with for several years. Our CEOs have known each other personally for many years and have worked on other projects together. And we've actually run uh, about 2,000 Bitcoin miners with them for the better part of two years. And they have almost 100% uptime. So we know just from kind of this, it's not like, you know, we go out and just sign a contract and we say, hey, go figure it out. Right. Like we tend to work with companies that we've got a lot of trust and rapport with and that we have data points over long periods of time that um, lead us to indicate that they can scale up and do things in the way we think they can. But I would say that's probably that would be like the biggest sort of um, pushback or like uncertainty surrounding Marathon that I tend to hear from folks. Charlie, I know Marathon kind of made headlines uh, controversially when you guys mined a block that was like fully AML KYC transactions. Um, first of all, can I get your opinion on that? And then second of all, how would that work? Like, I mean, if you guys wanted to only mine regulatory 
compliant transactions. How would that work in a future? I know some of these privacy wallet guys envision like every block just being full of coin join transactions. Yeah, um, I, it's, it's actually so funny you brought that up because something that's becoming trendy now, and I literally had this conversation this morning um, and I had it two weeks ago at a conference that Fred and I were at, is people toying with this idea of like, well, can we create a green Bitcoin? Um, you know, can we create one that's only purely renewable power? And then that has like some sort of special value to it, right? Um, we have personal experience with this because we attempted the OFAC thing a year ago. Um, so, and we learned a lot from doing it. Uh, the primary thing is that it doesn't work. It's impractical and uh, the community hates it. And for good reason, they hate it. So let me give you some context on kind of how that came about. So when we were kind of scaling up and we decided that we were going to launch our own mining pool, which we basically did because um, there are aspects that we don't want to outsource um, of our business. One is the mining pool operations. We want to be able to control where our miners are pointing to. We think there might be ways to optimize how miners are hashing and maybe you can extract a little bits of value. Um, and we needed direct insight into how we were being awarded for our operations, which at the time, Chinese mining pools wouldn't give you that degree of transparency and clarity. So we launched our own mining pool. As part of that, we started thinking, we started experimenting with, well, what are ways that we could, you know, differentiate? Because mining is kind of a commoditized business, right? Like everyone owns hardware. There's different types of hardware. People pay different amounts for electricity, but like, that's kind of it, right? There's no sales team. Again, there's no product, right? So something we were doing is we were going out and surveying a lot of institutional investors. And this was a year ago, right? So before the industry is where it is today. And something people told us is, hey, we're really interested in Bitcoin. We like this thing, but we hear that it's used by nefarious actors. We hear it's used to fund terrorist financing. Um, it, you know, it'd be really neat as if you had sort of a clean Bitcoin. If we knew that what you produced like was never touched by someone who's on the OFAC list, um, and you know, we we would have extra comfort around that. Like we as you know, sort of regulated and conservative institutions, like that's what we think would be interesting to see. Um, so we said, okay, let's try it. Let's see if we can figure this out and see if we can do it. Um, so we experimented with it, came out with it and found a way to basically, what we did is we kind of screened for wallets that were on the OFAC list. So we weren't, which got labeled as filtering transactions, right? And trying to change Bitcoin, um, which no one can do, right? If we pass, all we were doing is passing on transactions that uh, came from wallets on the OFAC list. If we pass on them, someone else picked it up instantly, right? There's no way to like, no one can control Bitcoin and filter transactions, it's not possible. We just wanted to experiment and see, well, could we do that as a business sort of for uh, the means of creating a coin that maybe would be institutions would like. Um, when we then went back to these institutional investors and said, hey, we've got you know this, this uh, sort of OFAC compliant Bitcoin, if you would, how much are you willing to pay for it? And they said, oh, whatever the price of Bitcoin is. So they weren't, you know, there was no market for it, right? There was this, there was this desire that, oh, we might be interested in this, but then no one actually was willing to pay for the difference. So there's actually, we don't believe there's any market for Bitcoin that's sort of branded differently, if you would. Um, and it also, it goes, it's contrary to Bitcoin's principles, right? Bitcoin being fungible is very important to Bitcoin. Um, work and uh and i think we learned that lesson very quickly right we reverse course um not too long after that uh came out um we we very much listened to the bitcoin community we also realized it was impractical and just didn't make sense um, but it was a super good learning lesson for us and now as people are starting to have conversations about other ways of trying to differentiate um you know we've already gone through that process so we're actually kind of turned to frequently as people who can give advice on this and say like Hey, is this good? Is this not? Like, would this work? Would this not? Um, so we tried it. It was, there wasn't demand for it. It also technically wasn't super feasible. Um, and ultimately like not great for the network. It also like, it just doesn't quite make sense and for the long term, right? So like if you mine something green or OFAC, right? Technically you could label it that way as long as it sits in your wallet and never moves. As soon as it moves, it loses its differentiator, right? because there's no serial numbers in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just a ledger entry, right? It's just data, it's just information. And so it's actually impossible to like say, oh, this Bitcoin is clean or this one is green or this one's not. Like it's inherently designed to be fungible. And the second it moves from a wallet, 
um, it becomes fungible again. So it was it was an experiment. We tried it, it didn't work. Not interested in doing that anymore. <laughs> I guess it comes from that pressure from uh, ethical investment and things like that. I, I can understand why you would try that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I can understand where the motivation comes from. Um, but yeah, as you say, there's not really any benefit. I guess because you, you mentioned the uh, price of, uh, of Bitcoin and obviously the fact they were unwilling to pay more. Um, when it comes to uh, your guys' mining operations, like is there a price uh, that Bitcoin gets to on the market where it becomes, well, there is a price obviously where it becomes not profitable for you guys to be mining. Um, what, I don't, again, you can tell me to piss off if you don't want to disclose, but like, is there, is there, what is the rough approximate price that that gets to where you guys start to mine uh, at a loss? And obviously, I suppose if you guys got some kind of plan for that, like there must be a period of time where, you know, you start going, okay, well, <laughs> we can mine like five years or whatever, but <laughs> You know, we can't mine for 15 years at a complete loss. Yeah. Something, something's got to change, right? Like, um, what, what, what is there kind of any plan around that? Any information around that that you, you have that you guys can share? Yeah, totally. So, um, this is also something that's unique about Marathon. Um, and I've been trying to educate people on this for a while. And I think now that Bitcoin's price has come down quite a bit, um, this is starting to resonate with folks. But, um, the importance of margin in mining is not just so that you make high profits in bull markets, but it means that you're very much protected in a down market, right? Or in a bear market. So today our, with our all in cost with the exception of purchasing the equipment. So if you think our electricity, our hosting, we don't build data centers, right? So if you want, you could say the CapEx for infrastructure is in this cost. Um, we produce a Bitcoin for about 6,200 US dollars, 6,200. So that's basically everything except our corporate overhead, which again, 11 people, not massive for a publicly traded company, um, and the depreciation of the machines we've already purchased. So we have a lot of room we can play with, right, in terms of Bitcoin's price. Um, something that's really unique about mining, and I'm sure you guys all know this, but like one of the most beautiful things about Bitcoin mining is that it's self-regulating in terms of like how difficult it is or where the industry sits. So because the difficulty rate adjusts and it becomes harder to mine Bitcoin when more people enter the market and it becomes easier to mine Bitcoin if people leave the market. If we were to find ourselves in a world where Bitcoin's price either came down so much or the total network hash rate increased so much where people's margins got around the 30% level, um, you're not gonna see new people enter the market because they can't basically earn enough to pay for CapEx of new machines. So no one's gonna grow at those levels. Um, what it means though, is that anyone who has really high power costs, right? Or signed bad agreements, paid too much for machines or deploying them too late, they're gonna get squeezed and they're either gonna have to shut down or sell their machines or something. Um, what that then means is that the difficulty rate won't grow and because we already own machines and we'll have them online at that point, and we're a low cost operator, we basically control a larger percentage of the network hash rate. So if Bitcoin's price goes up, more people continue to invest in Bitcoin mining, total network hash rate grows. We would, you know, in theory over the long run, unless we continuously grow our fleet, we would earn less and less Bitcoin every day, but the Bitcoin would be more valuable, right? If the inverse happens and we kind of go through a crypto winter, like what happened at the end of 2017 or 18, 19, then we're in a situation where the network's not going to expand quite as much, but we're already up and running. So we earn a higher percentage of the daily rewards. So we're earning more Bitcoin, arguably at a lower dollar rate today, but you know we're long-term believers in Bitcoin. We don't sell our Bitcoin, we hold all of it. And so long term that's actually good you could argue that's good for our business right so we've got this interesting competitive moat based on the way that we've structured our business where uh, we're very profitable in, in bull markets but then we've got a lot of downside protection in bear markets as well um and i think if we end up in this world where kind of bitcoin stays flat right or like in these this kind of this the levels it's at today um we're going to reach a point where in a year maybe, or this year, I think you're gonna see that there might be opportunities for consolidation in the space because not everyone can operate as profitably as we can. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how it shakes out. Um, it all depends on the price of Bitcoin, right? <laughs> Which is not something we control. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that I think because of our model and our scale, like is very advantageous for us is we've got, we've got quite a bit of downside protection because of that $6,200 per BTC cost. Yeah, it definitely, it sounds like your guys' kind of um, 
start of doing things, specializing, outsourcing, where it isn't strictly necessary to, to have control or isn't that beneficial to have control. Um, and obviously getting a lot of mines is, 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 it seems to be a pretty smart idea for being not recession proof, but, you know, uh, crypto winter proof, I guess is the, the best way of saying it. Um, I quite like that. I-